Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with If I Could Choose Only One Work by Composer X, It Would Have to Be Work T. Well, Composer X is Carl Nielsen, and Work T, well, it's got to be a symphony because he was one of the great symphonists of the first half of the 20th century, and he wrote six of them, and all of them are masterly in one way or another. But, you know, at the end of the day, we I think we all have to agree, whether it's your favorite or not is irrelevant. <laughs> Remember, this is the work which is the most typical, the most characteristic, the one that tells the evil god Cancrazans that he should not obliterate everything but this one work, but rather that this one work is so compelling and so splendid that everything else the man wrote is also worthy of preservation. And that work is Symphony Number no. 5, the one without the title. You know, it's really kind of funny because one doesn't have a title, but two, three, four, and six all have titles. That's one of the things that makes them popular. Four is a candidate. A lot of you brought up number four, the inextinguishable, which some people call the indescribable or the undistinguishable or the, you know, infinitesimal, whatever you want to call it. It's a great work. I mean, it's just a great work. And it's got that fabulous timpani battle in the finale. And that's one of the characteristics of Nielsen's art. Nielsen was, after Beethoven, the greatest writer of music that expresses striving towards a goal, that sense of inevitable progress that arrives at the place where it arrives at. And we knew it was going there from the very beginning. And the joy and thrill of the music is listening to and experiencing how it finally gets there. The there, in the case of Nielsen, is not the home key. It's not like it was in Beethoven. It's not, it's not where we started. It's where we finish. It's someplace else. But it's just as powerful and goal-directed as anything anybody ever wrote. And the piece that really does that in the most unbelievably powerful way is Symphony No. 5. It is one of the most organic and fascinating structures in all of 20th century music. It has two movements. The first movement is, is a contrast between three states of being. One is stasis, a sort of relaxed, phlegmatic, not really going anywhere kind of thing. The next is evil hostility, represented by the percussion, especially the snare drum, going yep, ba da dum bum bum, over and over again, and 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 a manic clarinet. It's just fantastic. And then finally, a noble, striving, yearning adagio, um, which seems to want to get over the hump, and which is opposed by everything else. People talk about you know the great snare drum cadenza where the where the percussionist is instructed to improvise as if he wants at all costs to stop the progress of the orchestra. That's a big problem in performance, just how crazy the snare drum goes and how powerful that moment is. But that aside, what a lot of people don't realize is that the the forces opposing this nobly striving theme, this ya ya da 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 ya da 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 da, it's just so beautiful. But the forces opposing that are not just the snare drum; it's also the forces of stasis. The ya da 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 da. You know, it's 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 amazing. Everything gets into the pot, and finally, in one of the most thrilling and ennobling climaxes in all of music anywhere by anybody. Um, that striving theme gets over the hump, but the effort costs it. The effort does not eliminate the hostile forces. They go marching off for another day, and, and the movement fades out inconclusively. It's just one of the most extraordinary things anybody ever wrote. Then the second movement is about regeneration, rebirth. It's about how we get to where we wanted to go, but couldn't quite in the first movement. And so it begins with this huge 
exordium with a bunch of themes, and then follow two fugues, one of which is somewhat like the hostile forces of the first movement. It has an insane clarinet going, and the tune is, it's, it's really cool. And, and it disintegrates. It's just, it's just manic, mindless energy. And then comes the second fugue, slow and thoughtful. And this time we know we're getting somewhere. Why? Because it's based on the main theme of the movement. Da 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 da, ya da 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 da. And that fugue, a soft version of this incredibly energetic beginning, actually gets where it's going. It thinks its way back to the opening of the movement and so on to the thrill packed coda, which ends in a blaze of glory. I mean, oh my God, the piece is so satisfying. I remember seeing Osmo Vanska conducting it with the New York Philharmonic. It was a very, very fine performance. And the Philharmonic hadn't played it in a long time. This was before they recorded their Nielsen cycle for Da Capo. And, and it just blew the audience away. It's one of those pieces, it's only about half an hour long. You know, it's one of those pieces where you listen to it and afterwards people go, where has this been? Because it doesn't get played all that often. But expressively speaking, the music is so direct. I mean, it's just viscerally powerful. Um, and, and it tells you exactly what it wants to do and how it's going to do it. And then it does it. And it's so bloody satisfying. It's just amazing. So the work has to be Nielsen Symphony Number no. 5. And oh my, what a great work. In fact, I think I'm going to go listen to it now. You should too. Keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.